Uh, so great pleasure to have as our next speaker, Jacob Fox. Thanks, Alex, uh, for inviting me to this. This is a, a, a unique opportunity during a unique time. Um, it, it's a pleasure to, to give a talk on, it's a survey talk on removal lemmas. Um, since it's only 40 minutes, I'm only going to be able to talk about a, a, a small snippet of the whole area. Uh, so there's many great parts that I'm just completely leaving out. Um, it also is a, a nice opportunity to talk about um, some joint work with uh, several brilliant students, uh, current and former. Um, this uh, figure here uh, is a cartoon um, from a popular magazine in uh, Korea. Um, the article is about mathematical families. Um, and it uh, uh, is a recent uh, magazine article that came out after the Abel Prize was awarded to uh, Lotsi Lovas and Avi Vigerson. Um, and uh, some of you might be able to tell uh, who's supposed to be who in this, uh, uh, in this drawing. Um, they presented them as Star Wars figures for those familiar with Star Wars. Uh, so in the top right, there's Laszlo Lovas. In the bottom right, uh, there's Avi Vigerson. Next to Avi is his son, Yuval. And above Yuval is uh, uh, Latsi Miklos Lovas, uh, Latsi's son. Um, and uh, so uh, I had the unique pleasure of being the advisor for both Yuval and, and, and Latsi Miklos. Um, uh, they're presented as Jedis in here. And uh, I think uh, Avi is Obi-Wan Kenobi is what I gathered from this. And uh, Latsi is presented as Darth Vader, which I think is not a fair uh, uh, <laughs> way to, to present him, but uh, it, it was an amusing article. So um, uh, anyways, I, it's uh, great to see um, uh, mathematics being popularized in a wide setting like this uh, from the great work of uh, Latsi and, and Avi. And um, yeah, this is actually what they look like in, in real life. <laughs> so this is uh, Latsi Miklos and, uh, and this is Yuval. Um, uh, and so I'm talking about joint works with them as well as several other students and, and, and a few others. Um, so Lisa Zauerman uh, is a former student and will be at MIT next year as a junior faculty. Oops. Um, and then Hoi, uh, Hoi Pham, I'm gonna mention some joint work with him that started when he was an undergraduate, but now he's a, a grad student at, at Stanford. Um, and Fan Wei was a former uh, PhD student who uh, is now at Princeton. Uh, Yu Fei Zhao, who's uh, faculty at MIT. Um, Benny, who was my former advisor. Uh, since we only have 40 minutes, I actually had uh, some joint work with, with Noga, who was my advisor's advisor. Um, but uh, I, I, I cut that out. I'm sorry, Noga. <laughs> um, and uh, David Conlin, who's a, a regular collaborator. So, um, so I want to talk about uh, removal lemmas. And it. Um, starts with a powerful uh, uh, lemma of Samaretti, um, which is this, this regularity lemma, it roughly says that every large graph can be partitioned into a bounded number of roughly equal sized parts so that the graph is random-like between almost all pairs of parts. So you have a partition of, a, of, a, of a, the vertex set of a graph into a bounded number of parts and between almost all pairs of parts, the graph behaves in some random-like manner. Um, and this is a rough structural result for all graphs. And it's one of the most powerful tools we have in graph theory. Um, so just to formally introduce regularity, if you have two vertex subsets of a graph X and Y, the density between X and Y is the fraction of pairs between X and Y that are edges. And the pair XY of, of subsets, uh, vertex subsets of a graph is epsilon regular. Whenever you take a subset of X, call it A, and a subset of Y, call it B, with A at least an epsilon fraction of X and B at least an epsilon fraction of Y, we have the density between A and B differs from the density between X and Y by at most epsilon or less than epsilon. Now the, the regularity lemma um, has to do with regular partitions of the, the vertex set. So an epsilon, an equitable vertex partition, that means you're 
partitioning the vertex set into subsets of essentially equal size that could differ by at most one. Is epsilon regular if all but an epsilon fraction of the pairs of parts are epsilon regular? Um, so basically saying that almost all pairs of parts are, regu are epsilon regular. And Semmerides regularity lemma says that given an epsilon greater than zero, there's some M of epsilon that only depends on epsilon such that every graph has an epsilon regular partition into at most M of epsilon parts. And um, the proof of Semmerides gives a bound on M of epsilon, which is an exponential tower of twos of height, a power of one over epsilon. Um, and following work of Gowers, uh, we know that this is essentially best possible. So this M of epsilon in the regularity lemma grows incredibly fast and it needs to be, needs to grow that fast. Um, now the regularity lemma is particularly powerful in combination with a counting lemma. And this is what's known as the regularity method. So the regularity method is you're given a graph, you're trying to solve some problem, you first apply Semmerides regularity lemma, and then you use a counting lemma for embedding small graphs. And as an example here, the triangle counting lemma says if you have three vertex subsets of a graph, x, y, and z, and if each pair of parts is epsilon regular, the number of triangles across the three parts where one vertex is in each part is roughly what you expect if the graph was random between each pair of parts of its given densities. So you would expect if I told you the density between x and y, y and z, and x and z, if the edges were random, that you'd have about d, the density of x and y times the density of x and z times the density of y and z times the product of the sizes of the parts, total number of triangles. And this is what the, the regularity, the counting lemma says, it's up to some small amount, depending on epsilon, that it, it's this. Okay. So what can you do with the regularity method? You can do a lot. Um, uh, and one of the really uh, uh, important uh, application is the triangle removal lemma, which says that if you're given an epsilon greater than zero, there's a delta greater than zero, such that every n vertex graph with fewer than delta n cubed triangles can be made triangle free by removing epsilon n squared edges. This explains why a graph has few triangles. A graph has few triangles is that it's really a triangle free graph and you've just sprinkled a small number of additional edges on, over, over the graph. This is really characterizing what it, what it means for uh, a graph to have a few triangles. Um, and it, it turns out that this sort of innocent looking statement has many applications in, in extremal graph theory, additive number theory, computer science and discrete geometry. Now the proof idea is to apply Semmerides regularity lemma. So you take a vertex partition of your graph into a bounded number of parts, almost all pairs of parts are epsilon regular. And you delete edges between pairs of parts which are either irregular, but there's few of those pairs of parts or sparse. So then there's not many edges between them. Now, if there's any remaining triangle, those three vertices, uh, sorry, those edges of the triangle go between pairs of parts which are both dense and regular. And then the counting lemma then implies that there are gonna be a lot of triangles between those three parts that they come from. Um, now, the triangle removal lemma as it's stated here, uh, um, only says that you can remove a small number of edges. It doesn't say in the statement how you remove them, but the regularity proof actually gives something slightly stronger, which is a low complexity way of deleting the edges. And we'll come back to this later, that you're only deleting edges between, you, you have a small vertex partition in terms of small number of parts, and you're only deleting edges between certain pairs of parts. And we'll come back to this in uh, this later. It turns out that for most applications, you don't need the slightly stronger version, but there are some interesting uh, extensions which really needed this um, in, in number theory. So things about the uh, Gaussian primes, there was some work of Terry Tao. Um, on this, and I, I want to talk about sort of these uh, these extensions a little bit later. Okay. So uh, one of the big questions here is uh, the quantitative bounds, which um, have been uh, haven't improved that much. So um, for every epsilon, we have a delta greater than zero. The regularity proof gives an upper bound on one over delta, which is a tower of twos of height, a power of one over epsilon, which is quite weak. Um, and a decade ago, I gave a, a new proof of this, uh, of the removal lemma that gave a 
a, a lower tower. <laughs> so instead of a polynomial one over epsilon, it's logarithmic in one over epsilon. And, and that's the, the current uh, state of the art. The best known lower bound is only slightly super polynomial. It's a quasi polynomial lower bound of the form epsilon to the negative some constant times log one over epsilon. And it comes from the barren construction of, uh, uh, of rather dense subsets of, of one to n without uh, any three term arithmetic regression. Okay. Um, now I want to talk about a few variants of the removal lemma. Um, uh, so uh, there's a, a, an old extremal problem in, uh, in graph theory or hypergraph theory um, that was studied by Brown, Erdős, and Shosh and others. Uh, so the question is the following, um, or this, this is the, the question, how many edges can you have in a three uniform hypergraph? So every edge is a triple uh, in which every E edges span more than V vertices. So if you look at you have e edges in your in your uh, uh, in your hypergraph. How many vertices uh, do they span? Um, it's more than than v. Uh, and the uh, classical theorem of Ruja and Samaretti, the six three lemma, says that f n six three is little o n squared. So if any six vertices in your graph contain at most two edges in your three uniform hypergraph, then you have little o n squared. Um, this, uh, so, so in a three uniform hypergraph, you have at most n cubed uh, um, uh, total edges and choose three. Uh, if you look at a pair of vertices in a six three hypergraph, so no six vertices uh, contain three edges, um, it's, each pair of vertices is in at most three edges. Uh, so it's almost linear. It's almost the case that every pair of vertices is in at most one edge. If, you have a pair of vertices and two edges, then there's no additional edge that contains any of those four vertices. And so it's, it's really very close to being uh, a linear hypergraph. It's, if it's linear, you can look at the underlying graph you get. So every pair of vertices is in at most one edge in the three uniform hypergraph. For each edge, you can put a triangle as a graph and you can get a graph in which each edge is in exactly one triangle. And this is known as a, a diamond free graph because, um, you know, what does a diamond look like? Um, a diamond might look like that. So that's an edge in two triangles. Um, uh, and so the Ruja Samurai 6 3 lemma is equivalent to this thing called the diamond free lemma. Every n vertex graph in which each edge is in exactly one triangle has little o n squared edges. This is a, a simple consequence of the triangle removal lemma. There's a, oh, essentially one line proof of this fact. Um, uh, and uh, it's enough to prove things like Roth's theorem that every dense subset of one to n has a three term progression. Uh, and so it, it's a very useful thing. Um, it seems that the quantitative estimates for these are interrelated with um, the quantitative estimates for the triangle removal lemma. Uh, there's a generalization of the 6-3 lemma that's still open. It's a, it's a famous conjecture. It's been around for about five decades that you can replace uh, 6-3 by E plus 3E. So if you have E edges they, and they span, every E edges span more than E plus 3 vertices, then the no, total number of edges is little o n squared in a three uniform hypergraph. Um, the case e equals 4, so 7-4 uh, is already strong enough to, to get Sam Reddy's theorem for four-term progressions. Um, so this is still open. Um, there are different directions to look at within this, uh, this problem. Uh, another way of extending the 6-3 is, is to look at the next case in a certain sense is 10-5, um, if you want to go into a sparser regime. And instead of getting little o n squared, we'll see later that for 10-5, it's little o n to the three halves. And this is some recent joint work with uh, David Conlin, uh, Benny Sudikov, and Yufei Zhao. Um, so, uh, th this requires a, a, a developing sparse regularity methods, and I'll discuss that more later. Okay. Um, now, uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the triangle removal lemma actually, the proof using regularity gives something a little bit stronger that tells you about how you would delete the edges. Um, and this is nicely encapsulated by the following definition. An epsilon approximate homomorphism is a map from the vertex set of uh, a graph G to a vertex set of a graph H 
such that at most epsilon times the number of vertices of G squared edges of G get mapped to non edges of H. So if you have a graph homomorphism, this is corresponding to epsilon equals zero, where you're not allowing any edges to map to uh, non edges. Um, but here you're allowing a little bit of, uh, of edges to map to non edges. And um, the triangle removal M actually gives you an epsilon proximate homomorphism to a bounded size triangle free graph. Um, basically each part you would replace by a single vertex. And um, uh, so this would give you the vertices of your graph H. And then if any edge goes between two parts uh, after deleting edges uh, from the proof of the, using the regularity lemma, then you would put an edge in H. And that's uh, how you would, you would do this. And um, generalizations of this to hypergraphs uh, and sparse versions were used by Tau in proving that there are arbitrary constellations in the Gaussian primes. Um, uh, so, um, every almost triangle free graph there. What? You mean every almost triangle free graph? So every triangle free graph. Ah, so, right. So, in the, in the statement called the triangle free lemma, it turns out that instead of having um, almost in, in the way that Oliver is, is saying here, it's actually essentially equivalent to saying no edge, uh, uh, no triangles. So, there's a simplification where you don't talk about the total number of triangles beyond the fact that you just say it's triangle free. So, um, so this, there's this thing called the triangle free lemma, which is a simplification of, of this strong triangle removal lemma that we just discussed. And so this triangle free lemma says, if you start off with a triangle free graph, it could be huge in terms of number of vertices, but any triangle free graph actually has an epsilon approximate, uh, approximate homomorphism to a small triangle free graph um, with at most T of epsilon vertices. And so um, what we were discussing was a strengthening of this, where you also allow not just triangle free graphs, but graphs with a small fra fraction of triangles um, also have this property. Um, and so, the, so there's this T of epsilon, one wants to understand how does this compare to the bounds in the triangle removal lemma or to the bounds that come from this 6-3 lemma, which is equivalent to this diamond free lemma. Um, so the diamond free lemma tells you that if you have a graph in which each edge is in exactly one triangle and it has enough vertices, then the number of edges is at most epsilon times the number of vertices squared. And uh, in joint work with Yufei Zhao, we, we, we proved some bounds on the triangle free lemma that depend on um, the bounds from the, the, the triangle removal lemma and the diamond free lemma. Um, so uh, the upper bound is by applying a weak regularity lemma and a weighted version of the, the removal lemma. It was also done independently uh, by Hoppin, Kohayakawa, Lang, Lefman, and Stagney. And the, these upper bounds, they generalize pretty Far. So, and also lower bounds. You can uh, generalize uh, this to H and, and to families of graphs, um, not just triangles here. Uh, the lower bound is exponential in the bound from the diamond free lemma, which is itself faster than polynomial in one over epsilon. So we know that in this triangle free lemma, the number of parts um, or, or the size of the small graph H that we get uh, has to grow faster than exponential uh, in any polynomial in one over epsilon. Um, so it actually has to grow fairly fast. Um, and uh, the lower bounds by a construction um, uh, and it uses some entropy methods. And it has some, some similarities to the lower bound constructions in, in the proof of the regularity, uh, that the, the regularity lemma requires a lot of parts. Okay, so this is some recent work with Yufei Zhao. Um, another recent work, uh, which was uh, with uh, Fan Wei, I also talked uh, somewhat with Noga a while ago about this. Um, uh, so let G be a graph on N vertices. So this is a strengthening of the clique removal lemma. So um, instead of triangles, there's the graph removal lemma, which you can replace by any graph H. There's also an induced graph removal lemma and a hypergraph removal lemma. But uh, this is a different extension of the triangle removal lemma or for cliques. Um, this is the local clique removal lemma. Uh, so suppose you have a graph G on N vertices. Um, each vertex of the graph is in few cliques total. So if you're in a complete graph, every vertex is in on the order of N to the R minus one cliques on R vertices. Um, but if you're told that each vertex has a small, um, 
is in a small number of cliques KR, then the graph has a, a KR free subgraph, uh, which is formed by deleting a graph uh, of, of max degree little o n. And so this is an if and only if it characterizes um, what it means for a graph to be locally close to being KR free. Um, and you, the proof of this follows the regularity lemma, but requires uh, uh, some more delicate uh, application. So you apply the regularity lemma um, and you get these parts and you'd like to delete edges between pairs of parts which are sparse or irregular. You can do this, it still, you still have a small fraction of vertices that would be problematic and that you'd end up deleting too large degree from them. And you set those vertices aside, it's a, it's a small fraction and you can delete all the edges between them that small fraction. And you can also delete the edges from those vertices to parts where it has few edges, the, the density is, is low. Um, and this essentially works with the counting lemma. You, you have to be a little bit more careful because you might get parts that actually shrink too much when you deleted them. So then you have to take those entire parts and stick them in this small bad set. But uh, it's a the proof is along the lines of the usual proof, but a very, a much more delicate <laughs> application. Um, and uh, we don't know, we have a conjecture for what in replacing KR by a general graph H, it doesn't look like this in that each, it's not the case that the property is equivalent. So if you take the bottom line that you can delete a max degree little o n subgraph and make the graph H free, the top thing that's equivalent to it is not that each vertex is in a small number of copies of H, but that each uh, subset doesn't extend of a certain size doesn't extend to too many copies of H. Um, and uh, even the formula that tells you how large that subset is is rather complicated. So I didn't want to go into <laughs> those details and it's still a conjecture, but we can prove it for things like bipartite graphs and odd cycles and some other uh, graphs. Um, uh, another direction is uh, trying to understand under what circumstances do the, does the triangle removal lemma or, or clique removal lemma, can you prove much better bounds? Um, and so there's different settings where this is known to be true. Um, in recent work with Yuval Vigderson, we were looking at, if I was told that a KR free graph had large minimum degree, does that give us good bounds for the uh, removal lemma? And it turns out it does. So if you have a graph on n vertices and I'm, you're told that it has large minimum degree and here the large minimum degree is, is larger than two R minus five over two R minus three. So in the case for triangles, this is one third. Um, if you're above density uh, minimum degree bigger than a third, if you have a small number of copies of KR, but here it's only linear in the epsilon, then G can be made KR free by removing at most epsilon n squared edges. So you actually get a linear bound um, if you're min degree is large enough. And uh, the key lemma that, 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 that gives this uh, is that every KR in such a graph of large minimum degree has an edge which extends to many, um, to many copies of KR. Um, so you can prove that. And it's a, this is actually pretty simple compared to the original proof, uh, but it's some careful counting. Uh, so so the, it's, it's completely elementary, um, this proof, although it's, it's, it's some delicate counting to prove this. Um, it's in the other direction, um, there are graphs and n vertices with minimum degree just slightly less. So this is, gives us a really a threshold for this property uh, with few copies of KR, but it's hard to make it KR free. So you can't make it KR free by removing epsilon n squared edges. So the bound here is not, not polynomial. So there's some interesting threshold going on here. And um, it turns out that this threshold is the same threshold as for uh, having bounded chromatic number for KR free graphs and to have a homomorphism to a bounded size graph for KR free graphs. So there's some interesting thresholds and they turn out to be all equal. Um, it's not so surprising that the chromatic number and graph uh, homomorphism thresholds are equal for cliques, but this one turns out to be the same and we don't know why. So there's some interesting thresholds and we don't know why they're the same. Um, for, for cliques KR. Uh, so um, there's a kind of blow up construction for this work with, with Yuval. You take a graph that's hard to make triangle free. These parts are, are kind of small. Um, 
and you uh, your whole graph is almost a blow up of a path of length three. Um, and uh, so these are big parts uh, and you make a matching between the graph that's hard to, uh, so this is a, a graph that's hard to make um, triangle three, but doesn't have too many edges in the sm three small parts. And you take a blow up of a, of a, of a path of length two. Um, these are almost uh, n over three size, these big parts uh, below, and you put a matching between them. So these are complete between the, these other parts. And you can check that, that uh, this is large minimum degree and um, it's hard to make this graph triangle, uh, triangle free and there's few triangles in total. All the triangles come from these three small parts in this graph. So this is uh, an example showing, um, well, if you work this out carefully, it gives you this result. Um, any questions about this? Um, okay. So, uh, so, so that's some recent direction. Um, another uh, another um, direction that, that's pretty recent is joint work with David Conlin, Benny Sudakov, and, and Yufei Zhao. Um, and we're trying to push the, the, sparse regu the regularity me method to sparse graphs. Uh, in sparse graphs, it's known that there's a very nice regularity lemma. You can extend the usual summaries regularity lemma uh, a version of this was originally due to Kohayakawa and Riddle, and later um, there's a very nice proof of Alex Scott, which removes some condition about dense spots in it. Um, so there's a very nice regularity lemma. The hard part in this whole regularity method for sparse graphs is counting lemmas. In, in the most general setting, they're just not true, and you have to develop the sort of right settings to get counting lemmas. Um, so uh, we were able to do this for C4 free graphs recently. So we were able to count C5, C5s in C4 free graphs. And uh, there was some nice uh, extremal consequences for this. Um, so one version of the, this sort of removal lemma says, if you have a C4 free graph on N vertices with uh, relatively few C5s, and these are the right normalizations for all of this. If you took a random graph um, with edge density P and P is uh, n to the negative one half, these are how many, the number of C5s you'd get would be n to the five halves. Um, and uh, um, so it, you can, a classical result uh, uh, is that every uh, C4 free graph and n vertices has at most n to the three halves edges. So we're really looking at fairly sparse graphs. Um, so every C4 free graph and n vertices with relatively few C5s can be made triangle free and C5 free. So this is removing homomorphisms of C5 uh, by removing little o n to the three halves edges. So a small number of edges from the C4 free graph. Uh, and the, as a, the main novelty is a sparse counting lemma for C5 uh, in C4 free graphs. Uh, we have some follow-up work where we're counting other uh, graphs besides C5 and C4 free graphs. We don't have a characterization though of what graphs we can count in C4 free graphs. You also can um, change uh, C4 freeness to just say a small number of not too many C4s. Um, it turns out this generalizes for other odd cycles. So you can count C7 and C6 free graphs, but the applications turn out not to work. And it's not because regularity doesn't work and between, because uh, the counting doesn't work. There's a subtle reason, which is after you apply the regularity lemma, um, the uh, edges may appear uh, between um, in the dense irregular pairs. These small number of pairs could, could put all the edges in and that's impossible in C4 free graphs, but we don't know what happens for longer even cycles. So there's uh, some technical reason that some of the results that we can prove don't extend to uh, for long, longer cycles. Uh, um, so so that there instead of the exponent being three halves, if you were to look at C6 free graphs, it would be four thirds. Um, so we also use a sparse weak regularity lemma and uh, a dense weighted graph removal lemma in the proof, which are, these are fairly standard by now. Um, so one of the corollaries is an interesting uh, uh, um, contribution to this uh, brown to shosh problem. Um, so FN 10.5 uh, is little o n to the three halves. Um, and, and this can be thought of as the next step of uh, some generalization to sparser graphs uh, or sparser hypergraphs of the uh, Ruja-Samurai theorem. Um, 
So all the components for doing also 14.7 work apart from um, uh, this issue that uh, we don't know what to do with C6 free graphs, uh, which have all the edges between a small number of dense pairs, um, which can't happen for C4 free. Um, okay, so anyways, um, a strengthening of this uh, result um, tells you that for uh, if R is at least three, the number of R uniform hypergraphs on N vertices with girth greater than five, and this is in the sense of Burge cycles, um, is two to the little low n to the three halves. So uh, th this is stronger than saying that the number of edges of an R graph on N vertices with girth greater than five is little low n to the three halves. And uh, this combines essentially that, but a slight strengthening. Um, and the containers method. So it's, this is a, can use the containers method to get this sort of counting result. Um, it's interesting for graphs, this is not true. Uh, there are uh, uh, graphs of girth greater than five with on the order of n to the three halves edges. So there's some interesting difference that's happening between graphs and hypergraphs here. Um, uh, Okay, so what are some uh, arithmetic consequences? A seed on set is a set of integers avoiding non-trivial solutions to x1 plus x2 equals x3 plus x4. So the, basically the sums of pairs of elements are distinct. Um, and the maximum size of a seed on subset of one to n is on the order of root n. Um, and it's a long-standing open problem to understand uh, the lower order term here better. And there's been some a little bit of progress recently on that. Um, but uh, another sort of general question is, if you have a seed on subset of one to n, and it has on the order of square root of n elements, maybe constant times square root of n, uh, what can you say about the structure of that set? So what, is, what do dense seed on sets look like? And this is a very fascinating problem. Uh, Tim Gowers wrote an interesting blog post about it. Uh, a lot of the examples look algebraic, but there's other examples of fairly dense seed on sets that look very different. And we really don't have any good answer for this uh, general question. So you can try to understand a little bit less than that. And um, uh, what we were able to prove using these uh, removal lemmas that come from the sparse regularity me method is that every seed on subset of one to n that avoid non-trivial solutions to this equation in five variables has size little o root n. And so this at least tells you something that you have to have four elements and their average um, in, your, uh, in your set. Uh, um, and uh, in general, avoiding this, just this equation. So if you're, you're not a seed on subset, but just telling you, you that you avoid this equation in five variables, um, the largest such, such, such subset of one to n is um, on the order of n to the one minus little o one. It's little o n, and it comes from a barren type construction. So these are in some sense uh, can be thought of as extensions of the results around Ross theorem uh, that no three term a subset with no three-term progression has size little o n, but can have size n to the one minus little o one. Uh, one corollary of this is that if you have a subset of one to n that avoids non-trivial solutions for this particular equation at the bottom in five variables, uh, it has size little o root n. And, and this turns out to be a simple corollary. Um, in, in part, this is actually has to be a seed on set. So if you set x3 to x equals to x5, uh, this is still a non-trivial solution. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, then you're, you see that your set would have to be a seed on set. So already you have big O root n, or at most on the order of root n, but, but, but this um, uh, you actually get um, from our results uh, little O root n. Um, okay, uh, any questions about this uh, or other things along these lines? Um, this is related to a... Uh, a fascinating conjecture that's still wide open um, uh, in graph theory called the erdos shimonovitz compactness conjecture. It's an extremal question. Um, so you're given a finite list of graphs, F1 to Fk. Uh, so for every finite list, you can pick out one of them so that the maximum number of edges of an n-vertex graph, which for forbid all k of those graphs, is still on the order of the, um, I, mean, I could have wrote, wrote theta here, uh, uh, of the extremal number of one graph. So it's clearly at most the extremal number of one of the graphs in your family, um, for any, any graph in your family. 
So it's at most the minimum of these extremal number of NFIs, but um, the conjecture is that it's within a constant factor um, of the list. And uh, it's, it's well known that it's false for hypergraphs by the 6-3 theorem that's really avoiding, you can write down some, some list of two, <laughs> of two hypergraphs that you're avoiding. Um, or, and you can also see it's false by this 10-5 theorem as well. Um, that we mentioned earlier, this, uh, but it's also false for linear equations because if you are avoiding non-trivial solutions to the Sinon equation, uh, you get the maximum size is uh, on the order of root n, uh, is asymptotically root n, and if you avoid this other equation in five variables, um, the maximum size is n to the one minus the low one. But if you avoid both of them, you end up get dropping below the extremal number for each of them at little o root n. Um, and so, so it shows in other examples. This maybe isn't too surprising because of the fact that it's not true for, for hypergraphs, but it, I, I think it's the first example of a failure of compactness for these linear equations that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so I wanted to turn toward more of these arithmetic examples. Um, uh, so there's an arithmetic triangle removal lemma. Um, and uh, Alex, we have about five minutes, right? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so uh, a triangle in FP to the N is a triple of uh, points with X plus Y plus E equals zero that add up to zero. And Ben Green developed an arithmetic regularity lemma using Fourier analysis, um, which tells you that uh, if you have few triangles between three su subsets of FP to the N, so triangles here are these solutions, um, but then most delta p to the two n triangles, then you can delete at most epsilon p to the n uh, points and remove all triangles. Um, this implies uh, a, uh, a result about arithmetic, uh, uh, an arithmetic property testing result about um, testing for triangles. Uh, and there's been a lot in this sort of direction. This has been an important case to look at. Um, so Green's proof of this, it also extends to general abelian groups instead of FP to the N, uses the arithmetic regularity lemma that he developed and, and gives a bound on one over delta, which is a tower of twos of height of power of one over epsilon. Uh, Kral, Sarah, and Vina gave a new proof using the graph triangle removal lemma, and it extends to not just abelian groups, but non-abelian groups as well. Um, there's a version of this. Uh, and so, uh, Ben and, and others have asked to improve the bounds in this uh, arithmetic triangle removal lemma from tower type. Um, and uh, with Laszlo Miklos Lovas, we showed that in fact, it's not tower type, but it's polynomial. And even you can tell what the, the, the exponent is. It's, there's some explicit constant CP um, and it's, it's sharp. And it comes from the recent uh, work around um, the cap set theorem and the developments around that. Um, so we use that as a black box. The, there's a strengthening of the cap set theorem uh, known as the multicolor sum free theorem. And that's essentially an arithmetic analog of the diamond free lemma. And uh, it turns out that the way that you can prove this theorem at the bottom is um, using a sampling argument and some careful counting and allows you actually to go backwards. So the arithmetic triangle removal lemma implies an arithmetic uh, diamond free lemma which is this multicolor sum free result. And it turns out if the bounds are good enough in the multicolor sum free result, you can go backwards and get bounds for the arithmetic triangle removal lemma through a, a sampling argument. And it turns out you can do the same for the usual graph uh, triangle removal lemma. So if you have sub exponential bounds for the diamond free lemma, it turns out you have similar bounds for the usual graph triangle removal lemma. So even though this corollary, if the bounds for the corollary are good enough, it actually gives you the, uh, through sampling, uh, bounds for the harder thing, the triangle removal lemma. And it turns out here that you get uh, very nice uh, bounds from that argument. Um, so it's, it's a counting and sampling argument. Um, and then uh, there's an extension of this that was done recently and uh, uh, with also with Lotsi uh, Lovas, uh, Miklos Lovas and, and Lisa Zauerman, uh, extending to longer arithmetic cycles. Um, it looks like on the surface that you should just be able to apply the same techniques. It doesn't actually work, at least the way that we saw it. And um, you, we, the proof is actually by induction on the, uh, on the number of variables here. So, so uh, the induction on K 
Um, we don't know what the right exponent is for this. So unlike in the case of, of triangles, we get some exponent. It's not that bad, but it's, it, it, we, we don't think it's tight. Um, and so it's an interesting question to, to kind of sharpen these uh, results. Um, you can develop also a strong arithmetic triangle removal lemma, um, which is you look at uh, linear maps um, down to a small sub uh, a small space. So you have some uh, subset of uh, of a space and um, of a large space f p to the n, and you want a subset of a small space, uh, which a few of your uh, of your elements from your large space, your subset from your large space, get mapped to um, uh, elements that are not in this subset X prime. Um, and so there's a, a, an, ex, an analog of, the, uh, of this triangle free lemma um, uh, in this arithmetic setting. And you can get uh, somewhat sharp bounds for this. Uh, it's exponential in the sort of bounds you get from the arithmetic triangle removal lemma is the, the key here for this strengthening. And it's maybe not surprising, it's the same sort of ideas, but it's even simpler in the arithmetic setting how you prove it. Um, finally, uh, Ben's uh, result about uh, arithmetic uh, triangle removal lemma was proved using the arithmetic regularity lemma. He also proved the conjecture of uh, Bergelson, Host, and Craw, which is a strengthening of Roth's theorem uh, called the popular differences theorem. Uh, if you have a subset of one to n of density alpha, uh, you have to, and alpha is fixed, you actually have to have a lot of three term progressions. Um, the random bound to, would be that you would have a density alpha cubed fraction of your arithmetic progressions uh, in, in your set A. Um, you can't prove that in general, but you can find a common difference where the arithmetic progressions with that common difference, you can get essentially the random bound number of three term progressions with that common difference. Um, and uh, the question is, how large is this n of epsilon? The original proof uses the uh, arithmetic regularity lemma. We got a new proof that instead of getting a tower of height uh, poly polynomial of one over epsilon, gives a tower of height polynomial and sorry, not polynomial, but just on the order of log one over epsilon. And uh, but the thing that's really I think quite interesting here is that um, we get a lower bound as well that matches that. And this is uh, so this is joint work with Hui Pham and Yufei Zhao. Um, so this is the first application of a regularity lemma where the tower type bound is shown to be needed, that you actually do require in this application that, the, that this n is absolutely enormous. It's the tower of twos of height logarithmic and one over epsilon. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is the other application of the reg arithmetic regularity lemma. So for one of them, one of Ben's applications, it turns out the answer is polynomial and the other it's tower type. And, uh, um, yeah, so I, I, this is an, an interesting other application that I just wanted to, to point out that regularity is sometimes needed um, in these various applications. And I'll, I'll finish with that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, so we've got time for a, a, a couple of quick questions. Um, actually, maybe I, I could ask one. So, um, so you have this, these nice results for C4 free graphs, and you were talking about thinking about C6 and so on. What if you go in the other direction and you forbid, for instance, K33 or maybe K23 or something like that? Yeah, so there's some positive results in that direction. I, I think some of the extremal applications are less interesting. Um, so I, I find the cycle ones to be quite interesting because it connects up more naturally to uh, linear equations and some of the other hypergraph extremal problems that people were studying in the 70s and 60s and things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you can prove some results along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it doesn't go for, for all things, but uh, there are some, some results along those lines. Uh, Oliver has a question as well. Um, do you believe that compactness conjecture for graphs, if it's not true in all these other contexts, is there a reason to think it is true for graphs? Well, we saw this example of um, cycles uh, of girth five. Um, so, so sorry, graphs on n vertices of girth bigger than five. Uh, there are examples of graphs that are bipartite C4 free graphs with um, you know, the, the point line incidence graph over the finite projective plane uh, is an example of a graph of girth bigger than five and has on the order of n to the three halves edges. When you go to hypergraphs though, we know the answer is little o n to the three halves. So at least in that example, there's some difference going on between graphs and hypergraphs. I don't 
have a good answer why for that, but uh, I mean, we can prove things, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So it's a very strong conjecture. I, I wouldn't bet my house on, uh, on, uh, on it being true, but, uh, but there is some plausibility to it because there's some analogs where um, uh, we know there are these differences. So let me just make a remark. The reason for this conjecture was that this was an early conjecture where everything was very beautiful and not extremely technical. And all the proofs were such that uh, somehow one of the graphs uh, forced already everything. So this is why it was natural. And there is a counter example to, to this approach, namely the Turans uh, approach who originally thought that the MC number is square root n. And then Erdős told him that no, it's log n. The uh, MC number is log n. So it may easily happen that this is true or it is not, but usually I say that such a uh, conjecture is good if it pushes the research in the good direction. It's well, I think it's a great conjecture um, to study. And, uh, I, I still believe it, but I do, do yeah. Okay. Oh, so uh -huh. there, there was one thing which when I felt that maybe it is not true, when I worked with Ralph Fordry, and there we had an example where we couldn't really get uh, the so so there were some indications that maybe uh, this is uh, this this conjecture is not true. Yeah, okay, Mickey, I didn't notice you were here. I'm happy to see that that you were here. I'm happy to, so thank you very much for this beautiful lecture. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Great to see you. In one so, thing, say a compactness example for a uh, linear equation. Say. Do you have an example where it fails by a lot? So, uh, so there it just became a, from square root n, it became little of square root n. And that's what it has to be because you can do a, a translation proof to show that it, it is n to the one half minus little o one for that well, example. Because the other one was n to the one minus little o one, but. Uh, Right, but we don't have an example for where, you know, n, two examples where it's n to the one half and you get n to some power less than a half or something like that, which is yeah. what you might might think might be true. Yeah, I, I don't know anything like that. So there, there might you be don't some know to prove weakening. That it cannot, uh, that it yeah, we don't have a proof that, that that cannot happen. Yeah. I mean, even for hypergraphs, is there an example like that? I'm not sure that there is. I think we just don't understand well enough. The, these extremal problems yet to, to answer some of these questions, the, the methods we have. I think something new has to be done. Yeah. It's so a great, we, these are great questions. We, we, we can carry on with further discussion in the break, but, but we should hand over to the next group at this point so that uh, host, hosts can be exchanged and, and, and so forth. Um, but before that, let, let's, uh, let's all unmute and, and thank Jacob for a great talk.